In January of 2012, AMD released their high-end beast, the Radeon HD7970. It was the most powerful single graphics card upon its release, and its vast feature set made it a truly next-generation card in every sense of the word. Shortly afterwards, Nvidia released the GTX 680, which stole the performance crown from AMD and was offered at a lower price too. A couple of months later, AMD released the binned and overclocked Radeon HD 7970GHz edition to counter Nvidia's GTX 680. It narrowly beat the GK104 Beast at the same price, and as a result the performance crown was handed back over to AMD. Almost a whole year later in May of 2013, Nvidia released their own slightly revised GTX 680 to compete with the now much cheaper 7970 GE. This card was the GeForce GTX 770. Let's start off with the specs of the GTX 770. It's using the GK104 GPU which has 1536 shading units and is clocked at 1046MHz with a boost clock of 1085. The VRAM configuration consists of 2GB of GDDR5 clocked at a fast 1753MHz, which is running on a 256-bit bus making for a total memory bandwidth of 224GB per second. Being a Kepler card, it supports up to DirectX 12 but only feature level 11.0, meaning compatibility with the newest games and applications is going to be a little spotty. Anyhow, the card also supports up to OpenGL 4.6 and Vulkan 1.1, so it's not entirely left in the dust when it comes to API support. Despite using the same GPU, the TDP is 18% higher than that of a GTX 680, which is something I'll get into detail on a little later. The GTX 770's story actually begins with its older brother, the GTX 680. The GTX 680 originally released in March of 2012 to take back the performance crown from AMD's Radeon HD 7970. Just three months later, AMD released their counterattack, the Radeon HD 7970 GHz edition, which was a binned and overclocked HD 7970. The GHz edition enjoyed a small win over the GTX 680 and remained the best part in its price bracket for almost a year. Finally, Nvidia ended the GK104 and Tahiti Leapfrog game with the GTX 770, which was a voltage boosted and overclocked GTX 680. Think of it as their version of the GHz edition treatment. In the end, the GTX 770 found itself tied with the 7970 GE performance wise, but it was actually $35 cheaper on average, which ultimately allowed Nvidia to win at this price bracket. However, it doesn't just end there. Over time, the 7970 actually began to gain ground on and overtake the GTX 770, to the point where in a lot of new games, the 7970 is pulling ahead by a pretty substantial margin. So why is that? Well, it really just comes down to how the Kepler architecture works. In a Kepler SMX, there are 192 CUDA cores split across four warp schedulers. Without any special optimizations, each warp scheduler can only issue one warp per cycle, with each warp providing work to 32 CUDA cores. This can create some problems as only 128 CUDA cores are in use per cycle, with the other 64 being unutilized. This is where instruction level parallelism would come into play. These optimizations would allow up to two warps to be performed per cycle, allowing all CUDA cores in an SMX to be fed. That sounds great and all, but since newer NVIDIA GPUs no longer require ILP, it doesn't make sense for game developers to keep optimizing just for an old architecture. As a result, the Kepler cards perform quite inconsistently from game to game, with some games performing as expected and others not so much. This has led people to say that the Kepler cards have aged poorly, and that's because, well, they have. It's unfortunate that they have this limitation as it can leave a lot of performance on the table when it comes to the newest games. So let's get into some of the improvements the GTX 770 has over the GTX 680. Like I mentioned before, they both use the same fully unlocked GK104 GPU. However, core clocks have been increased by a mild 3% over the GTX 680, and more importantly the voltage has been increased to help the card cope with those higher core clocks and to provide more headroom for overclocking. Not only that, Nvidia fitted better memory onto the card which allowed them to bump up memory speeds by 17%. To top it off, they improved their GPU boosting algorithm which allowed for much smarter boosting and to further min-max clock speeds. Now that we have the GTX 770's history out of the way, let's take a look around the card itself. My GTX 770 is an EVGA variant which I purchased online for $40. This one's their super clocked model with a custom blower style cooler. Clocks are not much higher than a standard 770, at 1085 MHz base and 1137 MHz boost, which is around a 5% increase over stock clocks. 
Anyway, the cooler is a pretty standard fare of a vapor chamber heatsink and blower style fan, which does a pretty good job of keeping the GPU cool. Funnily enough, the cooler design is the exact same as my old GTX 780, which I used in a build around two years back. It was the first serious graphics card I ever had, and unfortunately, it died only a few months after making that video. This GTX 770 definitely brings back a lot of good memories, and I'm glad to have a card with the same cooler design again. Anyway, that's pretty much all on this card, so it's time to get into some benchmarks. Unfortunately, no overclocked results today, as I encountered a fair amount of issues getting the card to respond to any overclocks under MSI Afterburner. I'm assuming GPU boost is interfering with any changes I make to core clocks or voltages. I know nothing about overclocking these Kepler cards, so if anyone has any experience with that and can help me out, let me know down in the comments. I just decided to leave it be, as we can take a look at overclocking this card another day. As such, we'll be running the card at the factory overclock. Results should be pretty interchangeable with the stock GTX 770, as the card is only overclocked by a minuscule 5%. So let's get into some benchmarks. Test system specs are on screen. As usual, all footage was captured on an external device, so there's no hit to gaming performance. Let's see if high-end Kepler still has what it takes to game, or if it's just better left behind. Our first game up is Phasmophobia, running in 1080p with the high settings with AA and 50% texture resolution. The card got averages of 130 FPS, with 1% lows down to 60. Both visuals and frame times were great here, and overall the GTX 770 did really well here. I could do a whole night of ghost hunting with friends at these settings. Next game up is Monster Hunter World, which I ran in 1080p with the low preset in DX11 mode. We got averages of 51 FPS, with 1% lows down to 42. Frame times were excellent, which made for a great experience all in all. The game's frame rate could tank when a lot of effects were on screen, which will happen quite a bit in the end game. Dropping the resolution slightly down to 900p should negate this though. Next up we have Minecraft, and I ran the game with the 1080p resolution and the fancy settings with the BSL shaders enabled and using the medium preset. We got averages of 70 FPS, with 1% lows down to 37. The game looked really good at these settings, but unfortunately our frame times were pretty poor here. In this case, you could drop the resolution to 900p and lock the game to 60fps to smooth that out. For me though, it wasn't too bothersome. Next game is CSGO, running in 720p with the low settings and shadows set to high. The card managed averages of 217fps, with 1% lows down to 105. Overall, the card yielded a very competitive experience thanks to the excellent frame times. Not bad at all. Next up we have Project Cars 3, and here I ran the game with the 1080p resolution and the low settings. We got averages of 60 FPS, with 1% lows down to 45. Frame times were excellent here, with frame rates only dropping when racing in rainy weather. All in all, I was really pleased with the results considering this card is over 9 years old. Our last game for today is Tomb Raider. I used the built-in benchmark and ran the game with the 1080p resolution and the ultimate preset. The card got averages of 64 FPS, with 1% lows down to 48. Frame times were very good and I'll say, this game is really a sight to behold at the ultimate settings. Overall, the GTX 770 yielded a beautiful, super smooth experience with this game. Well, I was pretty surprised by what this card could do. Sure, you definitely won't be playing any of the latest games due to the older DX12 feature level, but in a lot of modern titles, the GTX 770 can work wonders. There are better cards out there for the money, but the GTX 770 can still hold its own fairly well despite its limitations. On the whole, while the GTX 770 is certainly getting left behind in 2022 due to driver support and a lack of full DX12 support, it's still quite the gem of a card from yesteryear thanks to its raw power. Anyhow, that'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.